Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates LLP. My practice focuses on working with emerging growth companies as they grow and scale and exit, as well as working with venture capitalists as they deploy capital into those companies. KNL Gates is a fully fully integrated global law firm with nearly 2,000 attorneys and over 40 offices on five different continents. And today we're here to talk about how to raise seed funding for your startup via convertible notes and safes. Uh, a few pieces of background information to just discuss how today's uh, presentation is going to going to run. <clears throat> so today's presentation is recording is recorded. So if you missed some or all of it, not to worry. So long as you've registered, we'll send you a follow up with the content in uh, probably within the week or so. Now, I'm also running all of the tech in the background in addition to presenting. So uh, bear with me if there are any snafus, we'll get through them together. Uh, I've done quite a number of these at this point, and so I'm not particularly worried. Uh, another note is that because it is recorded and we'll be sharing with people later, um, please don't provide any confidential information. Uh, it's, this is not the venue for it. It's gonna persist indefinitely on the internet. Now, another another comment is if you've got questions or comments, please use the Q&A function uh, as opposed to the chat function because uh, I'm not gonna be monitoring the chat. I got plenty of stuff to do uh, and to take care of and I, I have gotten uh, pulled into the chat before and it's been difficult to present, so I don't wanna do that. But if you've got a question, uh, I'd love to hear what it is. This format for today's event is I've got about 60 minutes of uh, slides, and I'd like to take questions as we move through the content. I'll try and answer those questions in connection with the sort of sub subtopics that we'll be talking about today. And then we've got about 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes at the end to take any additional questions or comments that you have. Uh, so the only other real plug before we get underway is to fill out that audience poll. Uh, I'd love to know who's in the room and who could see see you live. Let's get let's get going. Uh, let me just ask real quick. Everyone can see the slides. How to raise seed funding for your startup at this point, right? Uh, let me just check the chat. Yes, great. So let's start with a few caveats. I wouldn't be much of a lawyer if I didn't uh, provide some of those. Today's discussion is general information. It is not legal advice for you, for you, for your startup, for your company, for your corporation. We'll be discussing rules and exceptions, patterns and experience. Those rules and exceptions and patterns and ex experience may or may not be applicable to your situation. And if there's one thing about rules, it's that there are usually exceptions to them. And then of course, there are typically exceptions to those exceptions. And the only way to really know is if you retain competent legal counsel to review the facts and cir circumstances of your situation. So the corollary to that is any off the cuff answers that I give today, or if we have a follow up, I, I do keep office hours and uh, happy to you know uh, set up 20 minutes to talk. Uh, again, for more general information, if you're interested, uh, any of those answers as well are not to be taken as legal advice. We need to get a conflict check in place and we need to get an engagement agreement in place too. And of course, just to reiterate, this is a public venue, public forum. So please don't share any confidential information. Uh, don't share it in this venue. Don't don't share it later unless and until we were to be engaged. And, you know, there's a great chance we won't. I, my, my goal today is to provide information to you that you will be able to take and Use yourselves, use with other counsel, or, or use with me if that seems like the right fit, a right mutual fit. So uh, a little bit of a roadmap of how today's conversation will go. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I think that's helpful. Uh, gives you a sense for why you may want to listen to me. And if you want to turn me out, uh, you know, turn off the, the computer <clears throat> and stop listening to me, that's fine too. I won't be offended. Uh, we'll talk about structural considerations when you're thinking about a seed financing. Uh, and kind of how you get there. We'll talk about a few considerations that I consider important to think about when you're pitching investors. Uh, we'll talk about the financing options and why you may use a safe or convertible note as opposed to preferred stock, which is often used with venture-backed companies. But 
typically a little bit later stage, and we'll talk about that. Since we're focused on convertible securities, those safes and convertible notes, we'll talk about key terms and considerations for them. We'll give you an overview of valuation and dilution, which I think is really important to understand in this context. And then we'll talk about common pitfalls and hit any other questions or comments you have along the way. Okay, so as I mentioned, my name is Jason Putnam Gordon. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I am a partner at KNL Gates. I already told you a little bit about KNL Gates. Uh, I've been practicing law since 2005. I'm based in San Francisco, California, uh, but I work with clients who come from all over the world, you know, in large measure because if you're in tech, if you're in venture, there's probably, or you're just in business uh, and you're at a large, you know, a, a large or a scaling company you're going to have some connection to the Bay Area. So that's how I usually get connected to folks. And uh, I love working with entrepreneurs. I actually, before I returned to big law, ran my own little boutique firm for a while. And so I've I've had the experience of uh, starting out with nothing, no clients, uh, and having to figure out how to get those clients, you know, more typically referred to as customers uh, in your case. Um, and sort of growing and scaling. So uh, I, I get to bring that experience with me when I work with clients and I feel like that really resonates with them and is very helpful. So let's see who's in the room. So I'll, uh, I'll give just one more moment and I'll take a sip of water and uh, we'll see who's in the room today. Wow. Okay. So we've got 21% from the Bay Area, which I would have to say is a little bit lower than I usually see. I usually see sort of 25%, but we've got a lot of folks tuning in from the rest of the US. Um, and whether you're here in the US or elsewhere in the world, or whether you're watching live, or whether you're watching on a time shifted basis, I'm delighted to have you here. I'm glad to share this information. I hope it adds value for you. Um, and I, I look forward to maybe our paths crossing one day. So we've got a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, uh, over 50%. I will say probably it's usually around 40%, so that's a great uh, great turnout by those first-timers. Congratulations. Uh, it's going to be quite an experience. You're going to learn so much. The serial entrepreneurs, we've got around 13% of those folks, and uh, we've got a number of other folks who are either at growth stage companies or even some angel investors and some folks who are doing other things. So that's the poll, but that's really helpful because I'll, I'll try and gear most of my comments towards those first time entrepreneurs. Uh, but again, don't be afraid to use the Q&A function and I'm uh, happy to try and answer your questions as we go along. So structural considerations. Well, today we're going to be focused on emerging growth companies and more specifically those that either are or intend to be venture backed. And, you know, typically not to bury the lead on these things, but we're going to be talking about Delaware C corporations. And I'll, I'll unpack for a moment kind of why that is. And this is actually going to feed in uh, very well into the discussion on convertible notes and, uh, and safes. And, and again, you know, it goes without saying I'm in the US, I've got, you know, although I do work with companies and clients from all over the world and, and touch deals from all over the world, uh, obviously venture is business and business is very sort of culturally driven and, um, and obviously tax and legal and regulatory. But, you know, I will be bringing my primarily bare area perspective, especially for those companies that are in the Bay Area, in the US, or looking to come to the United States. Um, so typically, if you're a domestic company here in the US, you're gonna end up with a Delaware C Corp. If you're outside the United States, that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Uh, but there are a lot of great companies that are formed outside the United States. And hopefully this, and venture is sort of really spread outside the United States as well. And it's sort of like, the, you will still get a lot of value, I think, out of today's conversation. So we won't spend too much time on this. but. The matrix, 
you know, that we typically will look at and trying to figure out what is the correct entity or just confirm what is the correct entity is taking a look at what the tax implications are for the company kind of long term over its horizon. Take about, talk about and think about trying to silo off potential liability for the owners of the company, right? That limited liability, uh, which can come either in a corporate form, you know, form of a corporation or form of a limited liability company, form of a limited partnership, et cetera. And when we're talking about personal liability, we're talking about the assets of the individual owners, right? Your car, your house, your bank account, um, and trying to put a firewall in place between you know any liabilities that arise in the business and the funds or assets that would be used to pay for those liabilities. We focus on and understand what the capital raising requirements are going to be for the company uh, and kind of what those investors, if you're going to be raising outside capital, what those investors are going to want uh, and what they'll desire. And so um, venture back companies have a model, which we can kind of see here on the right-hand side of the stage, right? Right, right, right-hand side of the screen. This is the financing life cycle sort of in, you know, under ideal conditions, the model sort of is, you know, within seven years of raising venture capital. And we'll talk about where that maybe fits on here in a second. You know, the company's going to have an exit and it's going to raise successive rounds of venture capital. Uh, but before typically venture capital from venture capitalists is raised, there's going to be seed capital, those initial funds to build out that initial team. And, and get the uh, initial product together, get the out, product out in market, uh, those types of things. And so, sorry, I just want to see something real quick here on the tech. So that's what we're talking about today, primarily, is that initial seed capital. Now, getting back to our matrix, we talked about capital raising requirements. Ah. What I went to, what I wanted to also further mention, though, is you know the success of rounds of capital. It's not like a hundred thousand dollars. It's not like two hundred thousand dollars. It is a, a significant amount of capital, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in the aggregate when you're looking at all the different rounds, um, and it's going to be over successive raises. Uh, and what we can talk about why that is a little bit later. But that's sort of the model and the capital raising requirements of venture back companies. Now we look at what the management requirements are gonna be for this particular company. And, and so typically for that, it'll be the investors will wanna have a seat on the board or multiple seats on the board if you're gonna have multiple investors in multiple rounds. We look at exit, what the exit strategy is and sort of what the optimal form is for an exit. If you get a chance to sort of basically uh, optimize based on that. And then we also take a look at uh, the regulatory framework. Some businesses cannot be set up as C corporations, period. You know, a lot, lot of companies in, for example, healthcare or professional services can't necessarily be set up and, and sort of be venture backed for a whole host of reasons. So um, regulatory framework is, is important. Now, Why a Delaware C Corp? The answer is primarily the investors are going to insist on it. That is the venture capital investors will insist on it. Delaware, uh, because most large organizations are formed there, they're known for having a uh, very sophisticated corporate law, as well as the Delaware Chancery, which is a very sophisticated court that is uh, frequently hears business disputes. Sort of the thought process behind that is, well, if you end up in a dispute, uh, it's likely that some other business had this dispute. And so there's some certainty with respect to how that dispute would be adjudicated, which helps people uh, resolve their disputes. And or you've got a sophisticated judiciary that will be able to resolve them, to, to move them expeditiously and, and efficiently through the court system and reach the correct result. That's the sort of two of them, the primary. Another is... Um, by and large, generally speaking, Delaware is relatively protective of uh, liability for directors and officers. And as a result of that, um, you know, the director, the the VCs who will require many times to have a, a board member, uh, 
you know, like to have that insulation or as much insulation as they can get. And then, of course, there's the Delaware Secretary of State's office, which is, um, you know, an administrative agency that processes a lot of the corporate paperwork that needs to get filed, and they move paperwork very efficiently. Um, they review things very efficiently. And while that might seem like a pedantic reason to, you know, think, well, Delaware makes a lot of sense, it, it honestly, if you're trying to get a deal done and closed, it it can make a difference. So that's those are the reasons why usually Delaware. Why C Corp? Well, it's primarily tax driven and it's primarily tax driven for the investor side. Most venture capital funds are set up as limited partnerships or other pass through entities, which means that the profits and losses of their investment of the of their portfolio companies, that is the companies that they invest in, will be uh, passed through to them, which then get passed through to their investors, which are their limited partners. And uh, one of the issues is, as you can see in the life cycle, uh, there are going to be a lot of losses, especially initially in, in these companies. And so um, between the losses and also the profits, uh, you know, to the extent there's income, that's an accounting nightmare. So they need to have a, a tax blocker in there. And that's why the company usually ends up getting set up as a C-Corp. Now, I frequently will get some questions about what if I've set myself up with an LLC? And you know, my typical response to this is like, don't panic, okay? You, you won't have been the only person to have ever done that. Uh, maybe there are some reasons. Maybe if we take a look at the matrix, the taxes, the liability, the ownership structure, the capital raising requirements, the management requirements, you know, your, your contemplated exit or the regulatory framework, maybe that's the right you know, the right form of entity for you. But many times it's not. And so there would either need to be some sort of conversion, either sort of a technical conversion or maybe a merger uh, to sort of flip the company over. Those are doable and achievable, uh, usually more expensive to fix a problem than to get it right the first time uh, for a host of reasons. You know, you could have um, stakeholders, who don't feel like they were treated properly or they have some sort of issue. Uh, and, and so, you know, they're reluctant to sign off on, on the flip, but, you know, don't panic. You're not the only person to have that problem. And, you know, we do clean these up when, when it makes sense to get them, you know, cleaned up and fixed. And obviously first, it's always a, a question as to whether or not there's something to clean up. So let me see if there are any questions before I move on to, to talk about, considerations when pitching investors? No, rock on. All right, compliance with securities laws is obviously critical here. Uh, securities laws, at least in the US, uh, are established and maintained on two levels. On the federal level, it's the SEC. Uh, on the state level, each state has its own sort of individual regulator. In a nutshell, they are basically consumer protection laws that sort of focus on um, trying to reduce the likelihood that you will have sort of fraudsters setting up bogus companies without, you know, any, any real... Uh, real desire aside from sort of raising money to just line the pockets of the fraudsters themselves. Uh, and so, you know, that's handled primarily through disclosure and, and, and some other sort of tech, you know, techniques, uh, and including sort of, you know, potentially reducing the number of people from whom you could raise money. So for example, so anyway, so in a nutshell, basically, you either need to, you need to comply with these laws. They're about consumer protection. The way to comply with them is either to sort of register with the SEC, uh, you know, and do do a, a filing um, a, to make your company basically go public, or the more appropriate at the early stages is seeing an exemption from registration. Okay, both at the federal level and at the state level. And those exemptions may require certain things. In order to be for an exemption to be available to you, there might be some requirement, like you only raise from 
accredited investors and or you've had uh, a, a substantial connection with this investor prior to raising so that you know they they would know uh, whether or not you're you know either you're either you're a fraudster in essence or you know whether or not the, the business would have legs and be, be sort of financially viable. Uh, so those are really critical as a sort of threshold mat matter. And then, you know, it's really important when you're raising from a, a, from investors is just to know your audience. Investors are people, okay? We, we spoke, you know, for venture-backed companies, the goal typically is at some point to raise venture capital. From a traditional venture fund, you know, those funds will have their own investors, right? Uh, and those investors are going to have expectations. Maybe they're going to need to get 3x what their investment is over the life of the fund, which is maybe 10 years. Um, so those funds are, are typically or, or many times sort of set up so that they will make a lot of individual investments in portfolio companies uh, with the goal of having a, a few really large successful winners coming out of that. And they will make up the return that is necessary to, to hit the expectations of the fund's investors. Um, that's one side of investors in the ecosystem. You know, there are also strategic investors and, and increasingly, you know, corporate VCs and others are playing at all levels. It, you know, used to be sort of more of the, the late stage, but they're really coming down. They're really coming down in the last few years, coming at the early stage and even seed stage. And they've got different, you know, different considerations, different things that motivate them. Um, and each one can be different. I mean, sometimes it is just a financial return, like the venture capital investors are, but other times maybe they're looking to develop um, a market for their products, right? If they sell widgets, they want more companies to be out there that need to buy widgets. Or maybe they're, they're doing a corporate development and they want to be able to you know, acquire talent or acquire technology. Um, or maybe they want to try and maintain their market position and you know, figure out who to sort of acquire and along the way. Uh, and then of course there are angels and there are a lot of angels who play in the early stage seed space. And so these are typically wealthy individuals, you know, and you would want accredited investors. And, you know, that when we're talking about an individual is, you know, usually an individual making $200,000 or more over the last two years or $300,000 of a couple um, with a million dollars in, you know, and or a million dollars in, in assets and in, in excluding the, the value of their personal residence. Um, those are not the only kind of accredited investors. Uh, but as a threshold matter for securities law compliance, that's probably what you're going to be looking at and thinking about. And they've got different motivations. Okay. So they may be motivated because they are a previously successful entrepreneur. They want to come back and sort of reseed. Uh, an area that they have information, like a technology or a vertical that they've got some information on or a passion for. Uh, they could be a friend or a family member who just believes in you. Uh, they could love your product or your service or what, you know, whatever it is that you put together. Or maybe they're motivated. I mean, we see it a lot in the climate and energy space. You know, they're passionate about something. And this is a way to, um, you know, en enable them to invest in that passion. So know your audience because they're people and you're going to be raising money from them. So you need to be able to, you know, persuade them with a truthful, accurate, you know, narrative and, uh, you know, your narrative in terms of how, you know, who you are, what the business is, what the, you know, contemplated um, business story and business plan is. So that brings us yeah, so I'm just going to answer a question real quick. Seed capital is part of an earlier stage, right? Yes, I mean, so like many things in venture, there's a lot of definition creep. But when I'm talking about early stage, you know, I would put seed capital in there. I'd be talking about, when I sort of think about early stage, I think about seed stage, maybe series A stage, the, sort of the initial stages where you're getting the product and service together and you're bringing it to market. That's, that's what I'm focused on today. Uh, financing options. So today we're focused on convertible securities, that is convertible debt or equity. 
These are also sometimes, especially the convertible notes, are known as bridge notes. They're supposed to bridge you or get you from kind of where you are today to that equity round, in theory. Um, or that's the goal. And they're, they go by a couple of different names as well. So you know, convertible debt, convertible notes. I, I like to think of sort of convertible debt as being the parent of convertible equity. Um, because as we see, as we will see, convertible debt is very similar to convertible equity, except for a few terms. And um, sorry, we're getting a whole bunch of it and questions coming in. I'm going to just close that for a second, and then I'll come back to them. The more popular and more common name for convertible equity is our safes and uh, safes are developed by a Y Combinator and you can see safes available on the Y Combinator website. Now, another option would be doing a venture round when you're raising preferred, you know, raising via selling preferred stock. And that's a different presentation. We'll talk about why you're not going to necessarily do that today. Another option, which I haven't even put on here, uh, is selling common stock. And that's really not a good option for a few reasons that we'll talk about today. Um, and we'll talk about those today in connection with sort of uh, effectively having to value the company right away. So why not? Why not kind of move directly into that? So why convertible securities? Well, they convert into future equity securities at a negotiated discount in a future qualified equity financing. So what is, that's a whole bunch of jargon. Let me unpack it. So you got your convertible security. It's going to change over and become stock, most typically preferred stock, when you raise your first venture round. Like in essence, that's that's kind of what the what the desired outcome or goal is. That's what you would expect to see happen if everything goes well. Now, things there are some other terms in there uh, in case that doesn't pan out. Uh, we can talk about that, but that's the goal. An instrument that converts into preferred stock when you actually do a preferred stock financing. Now, why do this? Well, this avoids having to value the company now. So the issue with trying to avoid to value the company now is, as we've talked about seed stage, building out the initial team, getting the, getting the initial product together, getting the initial go-to-market strategy, you, you know, you probably don't have revenue. You may not have a team. You may not even have a product together. You might just have a beta if you're, you know, kind of lucky. Uh, not lucky, but like if, you know, if that's kind of where you are. Um, and so how are you going to value that? You know, like financial models don't necessarily really work very well. They're not frequently used very well. Um, it just, it doesn't make sense. So the, the risk there, the underlying risk for the entrepreneur is if I undervalue the company, that means I've sold too much for too little a price. The converse of that for the investor is like, you know, if, if I let the, the company convince me that it's worth a lot more than it is, then I've paid way too much for too little of the company. I'm not going to get a great return. Let's avoid this issue until a little bit later when those experienced funds will come in. There will be enough money at stake in terms of what's being financed to have a good arm's length transaction and to put a value of the company on at that point. Now, another great reason. Oh, so before I leave that, avoid valuing the company. Um, and that's one reason why a common stock sale is not such a great idea because at, at this point for venture back companies, because you're going to have to value the company. Uh, the other thing too, is then you've got an arm's length negotiated valuation of the company and, you know, moving ahead, that might need to be the value of what your stock is that, you know, if you sell restricted stock to other employees or service providers, what they have to pay and or what the exercise price is. And so if you, you know, sell a convertible security, you might <laughs> be able to take a position that the price is lower than if you had sold com com uh, common stock. Now, great ancillary benefit is that it's far less expensive to do a convertible round than a series seed or series A preferred stock financing round. All right, we've got a couple of questions. Um, 
When you say accredited investor, what does it mean, particularly with respect to family members? So family members are not automatically accredited investor. They need to, you know, in order for them to be an accredited investor, they have to meet the definition as set by the SEC. So you can just go on the SEC's website and you can see what the list is for that under Regulation D. Uh, when does or does not an angel investment fall within S? EC regulation. Um, the answer is, it doesn't matter if it's coming from your family or not. If you're selling securities, whether it's stock or convertible notes, um, and if it's truly just debt, there might be other regs that are applicable. You, you should at least be thinking about Secure the like securities laws and whether or not there's an exemption. Now, many times, especially if it's a you know family member, even if they don't meet the definition of somebody who's accredited, they're gonna there, there will be some sort of exemption. But you know, legally speaking, if you're selling securities, uh, you got to think about securities laws. So we can, okay, so we've got a question. Can we think of convertible securities as, ex as essentially borrowing against a future expected VC round for operating cash now? Um, I would think of it as more like a pre-sale at a discount than borrowing, um, only because I, when I think of borrowing, I think of like having to sort of repay. But yeah, I would think of, I, you know, you could sort of think about it as being like a contractual presale. Now, if you have a convertible note, as we'll talk about, it will have a maturity date it, and there will be a time when it comes due. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So in that sense, I guess it could be a borrowing, but if we're talking about a safe, it would be sort of more like a presale. Uh, question about advisory shares. We'll get to later if, uh, if we have time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question about if there's a way to get compensated for raising funds for a company if you're not a licensed broker dealer. Uh, there are some very, very limited exceptions, uh, but by and large, there aren't really. So I'm not. So there are some folks who just focus on broker dealer law. Um, I'm not one of those. Uh, I, I would defer to them. Uh, but by and large, you got to be a registered broker dealer with the SEC if you're going to get compensated for um, helping people raise funds. All right. So let's talk about some key terms in here. And I've put asterisks by those terms that are found in convertible notes as opposed to safes. So convertible notes, have maturity. The money needs to get paid back at some point. We'll talk about that in a moment. It has an interest rate, kind of like your credit card, kind of like your car note. You know, you're going to get, there's going to be interest that's going to accrue over time. And it's got conversion terms. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later. But these are the terms that basically govern how it goes from being a $100,000 safe into actually shares of preferred stock when you do that venture capital fundraising round. Um, one other term that is really important to think about and is just the amendment terms of these safes and convertible notes. You know, by and large, you want to be able to have uh, a, a group that is the majority of interest on behalf of sort of all of the investors to agree to amend the terms as opposed to have to having to go out to each individual investor to change any of the terms. So let me try and illustrate that with <clears throat> maturity date. You start bumping up against that maturity date, and one of the solutions for that, rather than having to pay the money back because perhaps the money has been spent on development, you want to amend the maturity date and extend it for 12 months. You don't want to have to go out to each individual investor to get them to sign off on that, because what if there's a holdout? Then that person sort of gets, or arguably would get their money back or put put the company in, in bankruptcy. Um and have outsized leverage versus everybody else. So you, you don't wanna have a situation where you gotta get each individual investor. Uh, and then there are a bunch of remaining terms. It's not super common to negotiate these, especially in safes, uh, but convertible notes, 
there's like no standard. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Now, for maturity dates, usually we're thinking about 18 to 24 months is sort of what you see, but like really the underlying rationale is to do an analysis of, you know, how much time, you know, how, how much, wh what's the funding you need and for how long do you need it in order to build out and get to that next inflection point, that next raise point where you're going to have secured your preferred stock financing and those safes or convertible notes in this case will have converted into that preferred stock. And you want to have a cushion of time in there. And while I have to say probably standard is 18 to 24 months, we're also perhaps in and heading a little bit deeper into, you know, a less frothy time in venture capital. And so it might take longer. Uh, so pay attention to that. And out here in California, there are things like the California financing law, which, you know, applies to people who are engaged in the business of being a finance or lender broker. So this is not necessarily as much of an issue on the company side, but if you are a investor and you're making a lot of investors, you want to make sure that you're, excuse me, you're making a lot of investments, uh, you could actually be bumping up against this. And uh, you may want to make sure that you're complying with an exemption. There's usually a venture capital exception that will apply to the venture capital funds, but that's different than if you're an angel. And interest rate, well, it can be as low as the AFR, which is the uh, applicable federal rate. Uh, otherwise, there's going to be imputed itch interest, which is basically, you know, tax. Uh, and at least out in here in California, it can be as high as 10%. Uh, but actually, I kind of need to change this because there is a floating rate that can be um, tied to when the interest rates are high. And interest rates these days are higher than they have been two or three years ago. Uh, so you're going to want to check the usury laws in the states that you're uh, entering these into. Uh, let's see. All right, I've got a couple of questions which I'll try and knock out real quick. Um, it says, "Can can I give a brief difference between uh, safe?" and that of a private placement of CCPS. I'm not sure what CCPS, I, I wonder if that's like common stock or if it's preferred stock. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter insofar as if we're talking about selling <clears throat> difference between a safe and let's just say pref preferred and selling stock, let's just talk about the difference. A safe is a contractual right to obtain a number of shares of stock upon the happening of an event. That event is the sale of preferred stock. So it is not an actual sale of stock. You don't have any rights in, you don't have any rights as a stockholder. You've got a contract that says, it's basically a, po a forward contract for stock when, when the stock actually gets sold. Oh, a co compulsory convertible preference shares. That may not be, uh, you. I don't think that's a US thing, but if we're just talking about preference shares, preferred stock, the difference is, again, between a safe and convertible note, and this may be very different outside of the US, um, although I will say that many other jurisdictions kind of have looked to the US and there have been a lot of developments that are somewhat similar. Uh, a safe is not the sale of stock. The safe is a contract that gets you the right to get a number of shares of stock upon the occurrence of the event and as determined by the mechanics in there. And let's talk about the mechanics in there to get the number of shares. So whether you're talking about safes or convertible notes, the conversion terms are kind of set up like this. Mandatory conversion at a discount of a price paid in the next financing, next qualified financing. So usually qualified financing is is defined. Now, generally speaking, if you're a company, lower is better uh, because you'd want to, you know, you want to kind of have the ability to uh, raise a smaller round to get it converted over. Um, but, you know, that may not always be an issue. 
if, if you're an investor, you kind of want that number generally to be a little bit higher so that you feel more comfortable that, you know, when this round is negotiated, that, that, that preferred stock round is negotiated, there is sufficient, um, you know, there's enough capital at stake that the investors, those VCs will have done their diligence, you know, on the business and there will be an arm's length negotiated transaction price, right? Mm -hmm. What you don't want if you're an investor is, you know, the minimum size to maybe be $50 because then, you know, your concern would be the founder could negotiate with his or her uncle Harry, you know, uh, the sale of a hundred dollars worth of stock and uncle Harry could say, I value the company a billion dollars and so, and effectively sort of like wash out the investor, especially if we, you know, we're going off of a discount of what the new money is paying. Now it's typical to have a discount, right? So like first the preferred stock will figure out the, the new money will figure out what's the price they'll pay. And, and then the, the, the safer convertible note would convert over at a discount. So if the new money, and we'll go through an example a little bit later, but you know, if the new money is paying a buck a share, the safer convertible note will get converted over at 80 cents a share, let's say if it's 20% discount. Another uh, mechanism <clears throat> is a conversion price cap. And we will actually run through some mock numbers on this, but the concept is basically, it doesn't matter what the new money, well, let me say this a little bit differently. You know, beyond the conversion cap, that is, you know, beyond some number, let's say it's $10 million. If the new money is paying based on a valuation that is higher than that, we're going to use the conversion cap price. Um, now, because there are a lot of safes and convertible notes that have both a discount and a cap, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And we can talk about that in a minute. But in a nutshell, that's what you're talking about. Like, even if the new money is valuing the company at $100 million, the cap is $10 million, the note will get converted over as if the company is worth $10 million. Now, some other conversion terms that pop up in there, including uh, conversion upon a change of sale or control, or change a change of control or sale of the company. You know, what if the company is doing pretty well? We're not doing very well. And it gets sold prior to the, the safer convertible note converting over. I mean, there's just, there needs to be a mechanism to sort of handle that so that those investors can get their funds. It can get a sufficient return and that gets negotiated. Um, and then optional conversion upon maturity or something less than a qualified financing. So we see those two, uh, especially in convertible notes, because again, safes don't have maturity dates. Um, and the by and large, I think the, uh, the definition of qualified financing is safe is pretty low. I think it's like 500,000. Uh, actually, uh, no. <laughs> and it, um, my recollection is it actually doesn't. It just says basically sale of, of, of preferred stock. So um, it's kind of changed over the years. It's kind of gone back and forth a little bit. Um, but yeah, so those terms basically deal with uh, what happens in those events you know, so again, like if you're bumping up against a maturity date, uh, you know, one option could be to extend it, or maybe, maybe the investors have already negotiated. Well, if this happens, then we have the option to convert over at common or with the option to convert over into something else. So this can get negotiated too. Um, structure of how these documents get put together. Convertible notes usually are either in kind of one set of like one set of documents or one, yeah, one form of document or two. There's either going to be sort of an integrated note and note purchase agreement. Uh, you know, the note has the economic terms, you know, the interest rate, the uh, maturity date, like those types of things. Um, and then the note purchase agreement would kind of govern a, a lot of a lot of the other things that are in there. So, um, or they're all integrated into one. And then safes. It's just usually one form of agreement. Now, there are other agreements that would be in other documents that get prepared in these rounds. There's obviously some corporate uh, authorization, uh, side letters, which I believe that we will talk about or we can talk about later. 
which are agreements outside of the safe or the convertible note for things like information rights or pro rata rights or board observer rights, yada, 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 yada. We can talk more about that later if you've got questions about those. Um, but that's kind of the structure. Now, that sort of dovetails with the question which said, I did not quite understand the explanation of why convertible notes are less expensive than, um, than doing a series seed round. Let me share with you why that is. It's pretty simple. Uh, there's by and large, a lot less to negotiate with a safer convertible note rounds. If you're interested in understanding what like a full blown series C round set of documents, what looks like versus a safer convertible note, safe, go on the Y Combinator website, check out their safes. They're like three, uh, like four or five pages, I think. Um, and they generally do get tweaked just a little bit, but not nearly as much. If you wanna see what a, a seed round or a series, uh, what a preferred round would look like, go on nbcea.com uh, and look at those documents. I mean, I mean, you will see the term sheet itself, I think is like 12 pages or something along those lines. Um, and, and by the way, actually, one, one thing that I wanted to sort of plug for myself, and maybe this is like a decent, decent opportunity. I, I have put together a resource for entrepreneurs. It's available for a limited time because we're in a limited testing mode right now. Um, I'm calling it sort of working title is Venture Capital Training Camp. And it, it goes through a lot of this and also in a lot more detail. Um, and the, the last website I mentioned was nvca.com or .org, I don't remember, but the National Venture Capital Association. N-V-C-A, if you want to take a look at those. Um, if you want to see sort of what an example of a convertible note, an integrated for convertible note would look like, feel free to go uh, search for 500 startups, their KISS, their Keep It Simple Security, and, and look for the note version of that. You know, I'm not recommending any of these over the other. I'm just trying to give you some information so you can actually go out and take a look at what one set of docs may look like, may or may not be right for you, but they're out there. Upsides. So less expensive, simpler to negotiate for convertible securities. You don't value the company up front, okay? Um, and that can be sort of a impossible task. Um, and it helps maintain, a, arguably maybe makes, maintains the ability to have a, a lower fair market value. Um, in connection with option grants and, and, and or selling restricted stock. And downsides, at least for convertible notes, is its debt, and it may need to get repaid at some point, and extra liquidation preference above all the other equity. Um, so that means basically the company goes under or company gets sold, you know, but there's still these convertible notes hanging out there. Those folks get paid back first. Now, one thing to mention, which I have not mentioned before, and I typically do mention, you know, it is different all over sort of the world because I've worked deals all over the world at this point, but at least with respect to the Bay Area, you know, it is common to see a million, two million, three million, five million, even raised off of safes or convertible notes, sometimes even more than that. Sometimes it's even 10 or, or 20, uh, which is a little, I, I think that's pushing it in terms of what's common. Uh, but that's, that's sort of what we see. Um, and in terms of the flip over, you know, outside the Bay Area, if you're still talking about a domestic deal, I mean, maybe it's three or more likely 5 million if you did to actually do a negotiated preferred round. Um, that's probably what I'm seeing most frequently. And again, uh, not unusual to really see those, those negotiate preferred rounds to be later after successive rounds of safes or convertible notes. So maybe there is five or 10 or 15 million that's been raised, maybe not in the first round of convertible notes, but companies have had several rounds of convertible notes or safes. And if you are doing multiple rounds, you got to work with your counsel to make sure that all these sort of integrate and fit together. Uh, otherwise you're going to have a nightmare come conversion time. Now let's talk a little bit about the thing that typically scares founders 
the most um, dilution. Dilution. So if we go back to maybe this first substantive slide when we talked about the venture capital finance and life cycle, you'll see that the plan of the company is to raise successive rounds of capital. Um, you know, as the entrepreneur, you may want to have all the money up front, uh, but as the investor, the investors use that in part as a risk mitigation strategy. If they gave you all the money in their fund <clears throat> and you didn't perform, uh, well, they're not going to be able to get the return that they need for their fund. If they give you some of the money uh, now, enough to get you to a point where they can see, yeah, you can actually execute and the market is you know, rewarding this, then that gives them the ability to make the conscious decision to put more money into the company and, and hopefully be able to kind of dollar cost average their way up with less risk. Now, investors don't typically kind of, I, as I see, maybe they'll invest in a round or two rounds or three rounds. They don't necessarily kind of keep going through the whole life cycle because there are different investors that sort of different, that specialize in different stages of the life cycle of the company. But uh, yeah, they don't put in all the money up front. And as a, a consequence of this, in the model, it's contemplated that more shares are going to be issued in connection with these additional raises, which leads to dilution. <clears throat> and we'll move through that. So let's talk about some terminology first so that we're on the same page. And again, the devil is in the details on these things and you need to uh, you read the fine print. But for today, when we're talking about pre-money valuation, which is a pretty common definition here, uh, we're talking about the value of the company before the next round of investment comes in. For post-money valuation, we're talking about the value of the company immediately after closing. So it should be a simple math process, pre-money plus the investment equals the post-money, uh, again, when you actually get to the mechanics of doing some of these things, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and then fully diluted basis by and large, and, and sometimes this is called things like company capitalization in safes or convertible notes, but the concept is basically all shares of common stock that are issued outstanding. And then anything else that can be, or is, or can, or, or will become common stock under certain circumstances. So that would be things like the option pool, both the granted and ungranted, right? Because you'd sort of contemplate all those shares getting issued. They would include things like safes or convertible notes. And that's one reason why, you know, when we're trying to model pro forma cap tables, uh, and I've got some great content on, on pro forma cap tables in here, if you register and check it out, um, you can't know what they're gonna convert into until they actually convert. And the reason for that is because you don't know if it's based, if they're going to convert based on a discount, you don't know the price that the new money is going to pay. For sure, you don't know, but you can model it out. You can make some assumptions. And if it's based on the cap, sort of same thing. They could come in under the cap. So with those definitions under our belts, let's kind of just walk through some very, very simple examples. This is not taking into account the option pool or sort of any other equity, but just let's talk about some concepts here. Uh, if we were talking about a company that had a pre-money valuation of $10 million, and let's just say they had 10 million shares split among three founders, then founder A would three, have 333,000 shares, 3 million, 333,333 shares, or roughly 33.33% of the company. Don't use these numbers as if this is going to work or be applied to your company. This is just, again, easy peasy math. Now, let's do an example without convertible notes because I think it's helpful to understand. Like, let's just say they went out and they raised a preferred stock round, okay? And the, the investment was $3 million. Well, the pre-money valuation is... $10 million just from the last slide, right? Um, now, how they got to that was a negotiation between the founders and the VCs. Um, but once they did that, they divided it by the number of outstanding shares. And so the new money is going to pay a buck a share. That's $10 million pre-money valuation divided by the fully diluted basis. Okay. Um, Founder A still has founder A's 3,333,333 shares. 
And as a result, the denominator has increased, right? There are now 13 million shares that are outstanding because the VC has just bought three, just bought three million dollars worth of shares at a buck a share. Uh, and so, you know, Founder A has gone from having 25% to having 20, excuse me, gone from having 33% to 25%. But, you know, the paper value of that stock is now $3,333,333. Now let's introduce, hopefully you're all following along at this point. Let's introduce some convertible securities. Um, and I'm going to take this one as a discount going first, and then I'll take it um, as a cap, and then I'll try and like kind of weave those two things together. So let's just say same thing applied in this case, insofar as whatever the pre-money value is, I'm going to ignore the circular math and a bunch of other things, but let's just say the 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 new money agreed to pay a buck a share. Well, if we're talking about having a discount here, then the $450,000 convertible security with a 25% discount is going to convert over into the number of shares that would result from paying basically $450,000 divided by 75 cents, right? A 25% discount on a buck is $75, excuse me, 75 cents. So you would see in connection with the round that convertible security holder is going to have, or that set of convertible security holder is going to have 600,000 shadows shares. Now, what the heck is a shadow share? Where did that come from? If you read safes or you read convertible notes, you'll see safes referred to as, uh, well, I think they're called the series safe stock or something along those lines. Um, it's a shadow series. It's basically has all the rights and attributes of what the new money is getting, but there are some adjustments for some of the economic terms to, re to reflect the fact that they got their shares at 75 cents a share instead of a buck a share. So what are those terms? Those terms would include uh, liquidation preference. So if the company goes under, they only get 75 cents a share back as opposed to a dollar a share, which makes sense because they've only put in 75 cents a share. Um, it also pops up for anti-dilution clauses, which a lot of this is kind of getting beyond the scope here, but that's what it is. So um, that's the concept. Now let's, let's ignore the discount for a second. Let's just say you had a convertible security out there that had a $5 million cap. Uh, in this case, that $450,000 converts over as if the company were worth $5 million and divided by the fully diluted basis, which is 10 million, you'd see that the conversion price is actually gonna be 50 cents a share. And as a result, those convertible securities holders in the aggregate are gonna get 900,000 shares. So in this example, the cap is gonna be a lot better for those securities convertible securities holder than the discount. But that's not always true, right? Because the discount, the, uh, you know, a $5 million cap would be probably a pretty low cap, um, typically lower than what we see these days. And, you know, so if, if the cap had a $30 million, then the cap might not even apply unless, or excuse me, the cap might not apply. Now, sometimes you will see these two things work in tandem. Basically, the investors will get the greater number of shares of if the discount applies or the cap applies. Um, and so that's how those two things work together, right? So in this scenario, the cap is a much better deal for this investor. If they had that, they would have been working off the cap. A footnote for just a heuristic shortcut that people use that's not accurate. Uh, if you've got a situation where you've got both a discount and a cap, in a convertible note, you can't just automatically assume that once the pre-money hits the cap, the cap is going to apply because the way that the math works on that, it's going to probably be, uh, it's going to be, the, I think, the cap over one minus sort of what the discount is. <clears throat> Technically, that's the inflection point, but you know that's a little bit beyond the scope here. My goal today is just to get you familiar with the concept of what a discount is 
what a cap is and when you use them together, what the impact of that's going to be. Uh, good. We've got a couple of questions here. Um, let me just take a look at them. Ah, great question about whether or not fully diluted includes shares that are authorized but not yet issued. The answer is almost always it does not. Uh, well, hold on a second. Fully diluted would include shares that are issued and that are sort of contemplated to be issued. So you could have a situation where they're authorized but not issued. Uh, but because they're contemplated that they could be issued because maybe they're in the option pool or maybe they're subject to a warrant or something like that, they could be. But it doesn't usually, if there's a gap between sort of what's issued or what we sort of contemplate being issued and what the authorized number is, it wouldn't be that additional amount. And just for those of you who are not familiar with what authorized shares are, when we're talking about Delaware corporations, in your certificate of incorporation, you will choose a number, uh, you know, number of shares that are authorized to be issued. That's the number that we're talking about. And by and large, those shares don't have any impact unless and until they're issued or they're sort of contemplated or obligated, perhaps under contracts to be issued. Hopefully that answered your question. Again, uh, I kind of go into a lot of this if you check out Venture Capital Training Camp. Um, in more detail. Uh, what percentage of companies would you estimate never need to be externally funded? I mean, it really just depends on the business model. I work with venture-backed companies uh, <clears throat> and their model is that they're gonna raise outside capital. Uh, and then there's a question, I think maybe by the same person in terms of like how do advisory shares work uh, well, usually advisory shares, you know, there's two ways to sort of handle or provide some equity compensation to advisors. Very early on, maybe you issue restricted stock. Those are shares that vest over time to investors and they pay, or excuse me, to advisors and they pay sort of the nominal amount. Like maybe it's par value, maybe it's a little bit more than par value. Um, or as the company gets further along, maybe you issue op options to them. So let's talk about some common pitfalls. Non-compliance with securities laws. So we talked a little bit about what securities laws are, what their purpose is, how to comply with them either by registering or by targeting and fitting into an exemption. We haven't really talked about any of the perils or pitfalls. I'm not doing that. Uh, obviously, if you are a fraudster, when no good, when no a no good doer, uh, up to no good, you know, you can go to jail uh, if you violate the securities laws. You can be fined. You have all kinds of things. But, um, and that happens. And there are lots of headlines out there. Uh, but many times, you know, these are not nefarious actors. Uh, and, and if there's noncompliance, the, the thing that can really be much more of a bite is a lawsuit, threat there of a lawsuit. And or the require the requirement that or in order to cure it, you know, you may need to offer their investor, offer the investor their money back, the right of rescission. And you know, if the company doesn't have the funds <clears throat> and is not in as strong a position as it was before, then that could be uh, something that kills the company. Finders. Sort of as a subset within there, you know, these are unregistered broker dealers who, you know, offer to raise money for companies, uh, you know, for compensation, whether that's equity compensation, cash compensation, otherwise, uh, you know, those uh, having folks like that involved can make it impossible to comply with the securities laws. So, um, need to be mindful of that. Now, again, you know, I'm sort of focused on the U.S. and California, but it, you know, it may very well apply to where you're at as well. Another pitfall is not running pro forma cap table models. All right. So one thing you should not be confused about when you, you know, if you, if your company raises off of a safe or a convertible note, 
you are selling a piece of the company. Now you don't know how much of the company you're actually selling, right? That's kind of what we talked about before you, <clears throat> the peril of over or undervaluing the company, but you're selling, you're selling a piece of the company. Uh, the solution to try and identify how much of the company is running a model. We call that a pro forma cap table where you will make some assumptions, right? I will rate, you know, I'm planning to sell $2 million of convertible notes at a 20% discount. And with that $2 million, I know that I will, you know, or I believe that I will be able to <clears throat> put my team together, put my product together, get some initial customer traction so that I can then go out and raise my preferred stock round at a $20 million pre-money valuation. <clears throat> and I will sell 15% of the company at that point. And therefore, you know, the the new money will be paying X. And so when all this happens, the cap table is gonna look like this. Um, again, suggestion there is to, to try, and try as best as you can without driving yourself crazy to understand you know, what the financing model is gonna look like, <clears throat> not just for this round, but for the next round or two, or if you can, even later than that. Another peril is believing there are just standard terms. There are no truly standard terms. Closest might be sort of like a safe, but even those get you know, edited and negotiated. Uh, no standard terms. You gotta read the fine print on these things. <clears throat> Uh, there's definitely a range of kind of what you'd expect to see in norms, uh, but sometimes there's even deviation outside of that range. All right, I'm going to take a pause and just um, drink a, a glass of water real quick or have some of my water real quick. Side letters. Again, these are agreements that are outside of the save for the convertible note in this case, you know. And provide for things like maybe information rights, like that investor wants to know kind of what your financials are. Now, um, pro rata rights, that's the contractual obligation of the company to you know offer sales of future securities to the investor. Now, why would they want that? Well, again, kind of part of the model that we talked about before is not investing all the money up front, uh, seeing if you can hit those metrics and milestones so that you know they feel confident it makes sense to make that additional investment. That's kind of where pro rata rights fit in there. Board observer rights, the ability to kind of sit in on the board and, and provide comment or feedback. <clears throat> Sometimes even maybe even uh, representation on the board, although that's would get handled potentially a little bit differently. Uh, you know, if it's a strategic investor, sometimes there'll be commercial terms that are, are baked in there. You know, sky's sort of the limit. Um, usually sort of company side, you should be thinking about being because lots of okay so again as convertible note rounds and safe rounds have continued to sort of uh proliferate and have uh continued to kind of increase in the amount of, of money that's raised off of those rounds right so these are no longer just hundred thousand dollars not that hundred thousand dollars is nothing but you know no longer six figure rounds they're moving into seven figures, sometimes eight figures, <clears throat> and people are cutting significant checks, they may ask a lot for side letters. Um, you know, companies should be mindful of when it's appropriate to enter into a side letter, including whatever the terms are of that side letter, uh, because they can be, there, there are contracts, you got to comply with them. Uh, both now and potentially, you know, it's setting up precedent for the future. The other thing to bear in mind is, you know, each one of these side letter negotiations is a, is a negotiation and, and a papering exercise in and of itself. And it can really drive up the price of uh, safe and convertible note rounds, potentially even really significantly. Uh, and another peril is just failure to obtain corporate authorization. You know, founders just running around 
uh, issuing safes and convertible notes, et cetera, without you know obtaining board approval or and moving through the poor, the crop, uh, excuse me, the proper uh, corporate form. And I mean, there are a number of perils with that, including potentially uh, opening up yourself to personal liability. Um, let's see. Are there any questions or comments? If so, please use the chat, excuse me, please use the Q&A function. I'll, I'll put in my, uh, one more sort of soft plug for the Venture Capital Training Camp, which is in limited beta. Love your feedback if you join. Um, any other questions? Hopefully I haven't put you to sleep. It's still the middle of the afternoon where I am. I'm not sure uh, you know, where you are. Uh, I'll keep the line open. Okay. Uh, my LinkedIn is just, just look at Jason Putnam Gordon. Okay, wow, all of a sudden now we've got a flood of questions. Oh, okay. So we've got a question about, apart from sort of looking at company evaluation, do investors evaluate? Uh, I think this question is about like, does, does the investor evaluate basically the founding team? And I would say, especially very early stage, um, you know, there aren't really financial metrics of the company to go on most of the time. And so looking at the market, and I'm, I'm not an investor, uh, but sort of sitting on the outside and sort of in my experience, looking at the market, looking at um, the technology, looking at the ability to commercialize, looking at the team and, you know, whether or not the, you know, the company or the <clears throat> team, the, the investors can get comfortable that the team can execute are super critical. Now, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Investor, uh, investors are going to be looking very, uh, scrutinizing the, the team for sure. Uh, LinkedIn, Jason Putnam Gordon. Just look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, if you look, my name should be on here, Jason Putnam Gordon. There you go. Uh, the content will be sent around afterwards. Uh, so, so long as you've registered, we'll follow up with the, the, the presentation again. Um, yeah, and I mean, just in terms of some other really common mistakes. Uh, so one mistake I've almost seen made is that on convertible notes, you know, if we're really talking about companies that intend to be venture backed, uh, it would be pretty much unheard of to have a personal guarantee in the convertible note or the safe. That is the founder promising that they would use their personal assets to pay back the loan. Um, so I've, I've seen that be asked for before, but that would be a pretty bad mistake. You know, if you are in, you know, if you were on this path and in this model now, that's different than if you're like, you know, bank loans and other things, especially if you're in a different, not pursuing this model, you know, if you were speaking from experience, kind of, you know, opening up a law firm, you went and got a loan. I mean, the bank's would probably require that you personally guarantee it. Uh, but if you're you know raising from angels or venture investors and you're doing a convertible note and the model is for a venture capital backed company, you would not expect to see a personal guarantee. Ah, great question. If you've licensed some of your patents, how does that impact the funding process? Well, I think it's going to, there's, there's not an easy way to answer that. I mean, that's sort of a high level question, but I do get the question all the time of like, can I, can I keep some IP out of the company? And the answer is it sort of depends on the situation. <clears throat> Most commonly, the investors are going to want to see all the IP in the company. But if there's really a good business case that, you know, you can carve off some IP or license it out and there's sufficient exclusivity um, and the company will be able to, uh, you know, there's a credible story that, you know, that's what the company needs and it doesn't need anything further like that. And it's not going to be competitive that all those other licenses wouldn't end up in a situation where there's competition and everybody's interests are still aligned. 
you know, it could definitely work, but it definitely is going to take more explanation than your standard. Okay, all the IP is going in. If, you know, for another reason, which is that many early stage companies pivot, right? <clears throat> so maybe they generate IP and, you know, they think they're going to use it, uh, you know, with a particular product or service, but it turns out that's actually better at something else. Um, you know, if they'd already licensed out that other else thing, then the investors don't have the opportunity to, you know, realize their investment on that. It's that IP has already potentially gotten licensed out elsewhere, especially if it, you know. So anyway, uh, I think it's definitely, it's certainly possible to license out or retain IP, but it's not the standard, not the norm. And there needs to be a really good, compelling business story for why it makes sense for the company to be like that, why everybody's incentives are still aligned, you know, and I say that especially in the context of maybe founders retaining IP personally. Um, you know, I think, yeah. So you need to be able to address those those questions. Here we are on the questions section. All right, I'll keep it open for another moment. And if not, I will. Thank you and bid you happy holidays if you celebrate and a happy new year. All right. Uh, I'm going to close it down maybe a little bit early, give you guys a little bit of time back so you can go back to building your great company. I I'm... I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates LLP. I want to thank each of you who is attending live. Glad to have you here. I want to thank uh, each of you who is attending on a on a recording. Fantastic! So glad that you could find the time to spend some time with me today. I want to thank uh, Idea to IPO for organizing today's event. I want to thank KNL Gates for uh, supporting me in doing this. I do keep. Uh, I do keep office hours. So if you're interested in contacting me, just reach out to my email, each reach out to me, uh, jason.gordon at klgates.com. You can see it down there. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, with that in mind, I wish you, if you're celebrating these holidays, this holiday season, happy holidays. Um, if you're celebrating New Year's coming up, happy New Year. And uh, thanks a lot. Get back to building your great company. Take care. Bye-bye.